are more game engines out there than most people know what to do with. So for your average modern day indie Ooh. dev, it really boils down to a few popular choices. Unity, Unreal, Godot, and GameMaker dominate the market share today. And a big reason for that is that these game engines are, you know, actually powerful. But more than that, you can just go get them and use them. I can click download and look, I'm making games now. This lower bar to entry results in more people getting into game dev now than at any point ever before. A quick look at SteamDB supports that. As we see in 2024, the most amount of games ever released in a calendar year at more than 18,000 games. I think GameStop's gonna need a few more wall regs to fit all those. <laughs> Wait, they just sell cards now? Another thing we can look at is what game engines are being used and we'll see some familiar names. So something that's obvious if you're in the game dev space and what we can infer from this is that when someone new wants to learn game development, they go looking at how. And chances are they're gonna land on one of these game engines and through that learn everything. This isn't some terrible thing because they are good options. Where I think it starts to get concerning is the fact that typically when somebody picks an engine, especially if they're starting out, they never stray from it. Everything they know about game development is viewed through the lens of that engine. It can be pretty sneaky, but what should just be a useful tool in making games becomes something that traps you into being the only way to make games. And a good tell for if you're in that trap or not is how you might answer this. If your engine of choice just disappeared, you can't use it anymore, would you still even be able to make games or would this be like a hard reset? There's just a whole world out there that people are not tapping into. If we look at the list of engines used for games released in 2024, one perspective might be, oh, I use Unity. It's clearly the best. Look, it's the most used game engine. Another perspective, at least one that I feel when I see a list like this, is forget even these top four that we've already been talking about. What the hell are all these other engines? Who's using them? What games are being made with them? Like, what's the Solar 2D engine all about? I don't know. Let's find out. After installing it, I opened it up and it gave me this phone simulator and an empty Lua file. The focus on mobile dev surprised me, good to know. And reading the docs, I saw a physics library you could just import, so I did. And I made this quick demo where you could click and my face ow, will bounce ow. around in the bounds of the ow, screen. Ow, 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 Fun! Ow, ow. Now, would I say I just deeply learned Solar 2D? Yes. No, of course not. But I did just build this mental model. What is it? What's it for? What is it even trying to do? And more than just research it, I actually used it, which makes it stick a little bit more. So now I can just treat it like another tool in my tool belt as a game developer. And the next time I want to make a 2D mobile game, well, I'm going to use Solar 2D and try it out. Seems like a good use case for it. It is cross-platform, by the way. You can do web and desktop games as well. Why I'm even showing it in this video is you don't have to make excuses or wait for the opportunity to try things. Just start doing stuff. It's easy to do so, there's no pressure, and it's always going to be beneficial because you're just accumulating experience. Unless you're using Objective-C, then you're just suffering. And what's going to happen is as you go from tool to tool, the experience is going to compound. You'll start noticing the pattern across all these engines, like, oh, a draw function or an update function. This is how you handle input and audio and how to read files. Those patterns quickly become convention, the things you expect to be in a game engine and have to be there for users. And on the flip side of that, you'll see a reason why these big engines are big engines because they usually deliver on things that the smaller engines don't or purposefully choose to leave out. Before, where you might have used Unity just because someone told you to or it's popular, after some experience with other tools and trying to port your game to multiple platforms, you might realize, oh, that's why Unity kind of came to power because its whole mission was to build your game once and deploy everywhere. In fact, if you go to the Unity website right now, its first marketing point on the site is just bragging about how many platforms they support. So that still is like the core pillar of Unity and why it's so useful. After coding up a big pile of spaghetti in a lower level engine, you're probably gonna come to appreciate Godot's node system, which improves modularity. And for Unreal Engine, the blueprint system is something that's lauded as the best in its class in terms of visual scripting. It's great for non-programmers to really use, but for me, even though I don't like visual scripting, I always prefer it because it compiles way faster than writing a C++ file. That can take minutes with a larger project, during which I just start to question my life choices and why I'm even doing any of this. So between using visual scripting or having an existential crisis, the answer became very clear to me that I should just stop using Unreal. 
Which segues nicely into my next point, that this experience isn't just for practicality reasons or increasing your knowledge of game dev. You'll find out what things you hate, what things you like, what really annoys you. This is invaluable, because if you're not having fun making games, you're not going to make games for very long. And the only way to know what you find enjoyable is to actually try things. You might come to find you actually hate the way you're currently making games, or that it's the best and it just reaffirms you, like whatever, how are you gonna know if you don't try? But the biggest way you're gonna increase your enjoyment with game development is to now go online and argue about all the things you like and are good and how everything everyone else likes is bad. Now that you have that experience, you can do so with conviction and you don't need to pretend anymore or use someone else's opinions. It's time to get tribal. It can be really hard to convince somebody to leave the safety of the game engine they know and love. And I think it comes off obvious and unhelpful to say, getting more experience is good. We all know that, like, of course. The goal here is not to become a master of every game development tool in existence. There's, I don't even think it's possible. There's just not enough time. But just a handful of other things, if you try them out, will do wonders. Like, you'll start to see the forest for the trees. You'll start understanding, in a broader sense, the challenges that people are having in game dev as a whole, not just for your game you're making. And that helps you identify what tools are good at doing what things. And when you're doing a project, well, obviously that helps you choose the right tool for the job. Or at the very least, it gives you more options. If you're serious about game dev, you should know what's going on in game dev. You shouldn't just be a master of one tool. I really just think it's that simple. So if you want to see me go through that process, I'm trying things out all the time. Go ahead and subscribe and maybe watch this video because YouTube thinks it's going to tie nicely into this. But otherwise, go out there, go make something.